We've been in a series on the tithe. We uh, started a series last Saturday on the tithe. And then on Tuesday, we had the lowest crowd that we've had since we started our church. And I'm hoping that the two were not related. Uh, actually, it wasn't related. We had some people that were out of town, and then uh, we also did not have very good weather on Tuesday night. So, um, But anyway, we've been in a series on the tithe, and tonight we're going to finish up this series. It's a three-part teaching, and I do want to say this. If you have not heard the first two parts of this series, I strongly, strongly encourage you, go to our YouTube channel and uh, check out these messages because I can pretty much guarantee that there is something in these first two messages that you've probably never heard before. And the reason I'd say that is that I've been in full-time ministry for 28 years and I have hardly ever heard any of these things taught before. So I, I kind of took things from a, a different perspective. So what have we seen so far? Uh, well, one of the things that we saw last Saturday is that the tithe was God's way of providing for the tribe of Levi. The Levites uh, received no land of their own when they came into the promised land. Um, and the reason that they didn't receive any land was they had a different function uh, to carry out in the nation of Israel. Their function was to take care of God's house. The Levites were the priests. The Levites were the ministers. They provided Israel with a connection to God. That was their function. That was their purpose in Jewish culture. So what did God do? God instructed the Israelites, the other tribes, they were instructed to put 10% of their income, 10% of their provision, 10% of their crops, their food, their wine, their olive oil, 10% of Israel's economy went to the one tribe that had no means of providing their own wealth. And that was the Levites. And this was the way God wanted it. This was, the, this was the way God established it. The Levites are too busy to hold a day job. They're too busy doing the work of the Lord. So the other 12 tribes had the responsibility of, uh, not only the responsibility, they had the privilege of providing for the Levites. And the tithe was the Levites' provision. Now God established the Levites as the people who could accept contributions on behalf of God. He, he said, you're, you're giving it to me, but the, the Levites are receiving it on my behalf. And what I told you on Tuesday is the tithe is between you and God, not between you and the church. All right. The church might receive your tithe, but you don't tithe to the church. You tithe to God. Your tithe is given to God. God instituted the church to receive the tithe on God's behalf. And on Tuesday we saw that the purpose of the tithe is to give God's people a legal spiritual connection to the kingdom for the protection of our finances. That's the purpose of the tithe, to give us a connection, a kingdom connection through our, through our finances. Now, uh, one of the things that I told you the other night is if the only reason that the Israelites were commanded to tithe was to take care of the Levites, because the Levites had no provision of their own, if the only reason for the tithe was to take care of the Levites, then why were the Levites commanded to tithe? If the only reason was to take care of them, they were taken care of, so why did they need to tithe? Because they also need a legal spiritual connection to the kingdom of God for their finances. Everyone does. You do too. Amen. Amen. So that's why the Levites were also required to tithe. The tithe wasn't just for their provision. It, the, the tithe is a legal matter. It's a spiritual matter. So tonight I want to finish up this service or this series with one of the most powerful revelations that I've ever received on the topic of tithing. And so uh, we've been asking the question, and I haven't, I, I haven't answered the question yet. I've heard people ask this question all of my life, all my career. People ask, is the tithe an Old Testament practice, or is it a New Testament practice, or is it both, or is it neither? 
So we're going we're gonna to dig into that and we're going to answer that question tonight. So tonight's message is going to be a little bit of deeper theological teaching. This is not 101 teaching. This, this is a little deeper. T tonight we're going to have some meat, not just milk. So are, are you ready to plug in and stay with me tonight? Yes. All right, fasten your seatbelts and let's go. Uh, the first thing I want to do is I want to ask you a question and somebody can yell out the answer. Can somebody tell me who was the first person in the Bible to tithe? I think I heard somebody say it. It was Abraham. Abraham was the first person to tithe. This is in Genesis chapter 14. You can look it up on your own time. Abraham tithed to the priest known as Melchizedek. Now, Abraham did not tithe under the law. He did not tithe under obligation. Abraham tithed by faith and simply out of the gratefulness and the thankfulness of his heart. That's why Abraham tithed. Abraham did not tithe under the law because the law hadn't been given yet. God gave the law to Moses 400 years later. So Abraham's tithe was not done out of compulsion. It was not done out of obligation. It wasn't done because he had to. It was done because he wanted to. What had happened was there was some evil uh, enemies, some evil kings is what the Bible says. These guys were leaders. They were rulers. Evil people had kidnapped Abraham's family, and they ran off with them. And so Abraham went to rescue his family from these evil rulers, these evil kings that had abducted his family. And when Abraham ran after them, God helped Abraham defeat these guys, and he rescued his family, and he slaughtered the bad guys and brought his family home. Now, you got to keep in mind, in those days, when you won a battle or when you won a war, you also won the spoils of war. How many have heard that, that term? So Abraham not only rescued his family, but when he killed off these guys that had kidnapped his family, he took all their stuff, too. Because, hey, you're not going to need it anymore. So Abraham brought the spoils of war back. And when he did, out of thankfulness to God for the fact that God helped him rescue his family, Abraham gave one-tenth of everything to Melchizedek. Melchizedek was the great high priest. So let's talk about Melchizedek for just a second. Melchizedek was the king of the city of Salem. He was the founder of the city of Salem. And the word Salem is the same word as the Hebrew word Shalom. Shalom, Salem, it's the same word. So that city called Salem, it was founded by Melchizedek. Melchizedek was the ruler of that city. And then years and years later, the city of Salem had its name changed from Salem to Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Okay, so Melchizedek is the founder of the city of Jerusalem. Not only that, Melchizedek, a lot of Jewish historians and Jewish scholars believe that Melchizedek was actually Noah's son, Shem. How many remember Shem, Ham, and Japheth? And the Bible says that Noah pronounced a blessing on Shem. He pronounced a curse on Ham. And then he didn't really bless Japheth. He said, Japheth, you need to stay connected to Shem because he's got the blessing and the blessing is going to come on you through him. But the blessing was pronounced on Shem. And like I said, a lot of Jewish uh, scholars and historians believe that Shem changed his name to Melchizedek. Melchizedek was the one who founded the city of Salem that later on became Jerusalem. Okay, so the book of Hebrews reminds us that Jesus is our great high priest. Amen? But Jesus is not a Levitical priest. He's not a Levite. He's not from the tribe of Levi. The, the first great high priest in the tribe of Levi was Aaron. So Jesus is not a priest in the order of Aaron. He's not a priest in the order of Levi. 
In fact, Jesus wasn't even a member of the tribe of Levi. Je Jesus was a member of the tribe of Judah. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah means praise. So David wrote a psalm, and in that psalm, he prophesied that Jesus would be a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This is what David said in Psalm chapter 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So this is a prophecy about Jesus. Jesus is our great high priest, but he's not a Levitical high priest. He's a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Mel Melchizedek predated the, the priesthood of Levi by 400 years. And Melchizedek was the priest that Abraham tithed to. Now, the book of Hebrews also tells us that the Melchizedek priesthood is better than the priesthood of Levi. And, and we're going to read this here in a second. And in fact, it actually says that in a sense, Levi himself tithed to Melchizedek through Abraham. We're, we're going to read that here in a minute. And then the book of Hebrews also tells us that the new covenant, which you and I belong to, the, the new covenant is a better covenant than the old covenant. Amen. Amen. It's a better covenant based on better promises. Amen. Amen. And the Melchizedek priesthood is greater than the Levitical priesthood. So I want to look at that real quick. All right? So just, just track with me because I'm going somewhere with this. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, or what later became Jerusalem, priest of the Most High God, Melchizedek met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. The slaughter of the kings was when Abraham went out against these evil kings that had abducted his family. He slaughtered them. He brought his family back. Verse 2. And to him, Melchizedek, and to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything to Melchizedek. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, which means shalom, all right? That is king of peace. Because the word shalom in the Hebrew means peace, right? So Melchizedek is the king of peace. And in fact, that word shalom, we've talked about it before. The word shalom, it means peace because everything is whole in your life. There's nothing missing and there's nothing broken in your life. That's what shalom means. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Since there's nothing missing and there's nothing broken in your life, you are at peace. Right? Your life is completely whole and you are at peace. That's what shalom means. And that's what the city of Salem meant. So Mel Melchizedek is the king of righteousness and he's the king of peace. That's what his name means and that's what his kingship means. Verse 3, Melchizedek is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. So let's stop here for a second and let's uh, break this down a little bit. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of historians believe that Melchizedek was likely Shem. There are some people who also believe that Melchizedek was Jesus himself. Jesus appearing in the Old Testament. And I'm not going to rule out that possibility, but I will say that the verse we just read, it says he resembles the Son of God and he continues a priest forever. So I tend to think that he's not Jesus. He just resembles Jesus. He's a, a foreshadow of Jesus. He's a persona that Shem created. And Shem, he's, he's got a father and a mother. Th this says that Melchizedek does not have a father, does not have a mother, does not have genealogy. He does not have a big beginning of days nor an end of life. Well, Shem had a father and a mother, right? Shem had a birth date and a death date. He had a beginning and an end. 
but the persona of Melchizedek didn't. Melchizedek had no father or mother. Mel Melchizedek had no genealogy. He had no beginning. He had no ending because he resembles Jesus. He's a, he's a, he's a, uh, a metaphor of Jesus, a foreshadow of Jesus. But Jesus is our high priest in the order of Melchizedek. All right. So let's go on. Verse 4. It says, see how great this man was. He's talking about Melchizedek. See how great Melchizedek was. To whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi, the, the Levites, the priests, who received the priestly office, have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, from their Israelite brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, Melchizedek, who does not have his descent from them, he received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Abraham had the promises. Melchizedek blessed him. Verse 7. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. So, what is this saying? First of all, it's saying Melchizedek did not descend from Abraham like the Levites did. Melchizedek pronounced a blessing on Abraham, and it's undisputable that the blessing is always spoken from a superior person to an inferior person. The inferior doesn't bless the superior. The superior blesses the inferior. That's what it's saying here. Okay? Abraham, in other words, Abraham is inferior to Melchizedek. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. So if Abraham is inferior to Melchizedek, then so are Abraham's descendants. Isaac is inferior to Melchizedek. Jacob who became Israel, he's inferior. All of Jacob's sons, including Levi, are inferior to Melchizedek. Verse eight, in the one case, tithes are received by mortal men. He's talking about tithes that are received by the Levites. But in the other case, the tithes were received by one of whom it is testified that he lives because Melchizedek lives forever. He has no beginning of days. He has no end of days. Jesus is a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So in the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, Levites. But in the case of Abraham, it was received by one who testifies that he lives forever. Verse 9. This is interesting. One might even say that Levi himself who receives tithes, the Levites do. Levi himself paid tithes through Abraham. For he was still in the loins of his ancestor Abraham when Melchizedek met him. Isn't that interesting? So it can even be argued that Levi himself tithed to Melchizedek, even though Levi wasn't born yet. It can be argued from a certain point of view that the Levites tithed to Melchizedek. The bottom line is this. The Melchizedek priesthood is greater than the Levitical priesthood. That's what this is saying in Hebrews 7. And the new covenant is better than the old covenant. Amen? Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. It says, but now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. For Jesus is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. Amen. We've got a better covenant than the old covenant. Amen. Amen. Verse 7, if the first covenant had been faultless, if there was nothing wrong with it, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. So, the first covenant was a good covenant. Ours is better. Amen. Amen. So let's stop here and let's gather ourselves before we go on. Number one, there's a new covenant which is better than the old covenant. Amen. Amen. Number two, Jesus belongs to a different priesthood 
It's the Melchizedek priesthood, and it's a priesthood that's greater than the Levitical priesthood. Amen? And it's also a priesthood that predates the Levitical priesthood by about 400 years. And what we just saw, number three, it can even be argued that the Levitical priesthood tithed to the Melchizedek priesthood. That's how great the priesthood of Melchizedek is. So, the very first tithe, which was the tithe that Abraham gave, was a tithe that was given by faith, not by law, not under obligation. The law had not been given yet. The priesthood that we answer to is the priesthood of Jesus, and Jesus is a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. We're all on the same page here? So, New Testament believers don't tithe to Levi. We don't tithe to the, to the tribe of Levi. New Testament believers don't tithe under the law. New Testament believers don't tithe under obligation. We tithe to the same priesthood that Abraham did. We tithe to the priesthood of Melchizedek. Not under the law, but just as Abraham did, we tithe as an act of gratefulness and an act of faith. That's why Abraham tithed. Not because anybody required it of him. Our tithe is a tithe by faith. Our tithe is a tithe under grace, not under the law. And this is important. Our tithe is a better tithe than the Old Testament tithe because it's a part of a better covenant based on better promises. Amen. Amen. Now we talked about the promises on Tuesday. We looked at the promises that God made to tithers in Malachi chapter 3. How many remember that? Malachi 3 says that if you bring all the tithes into the storehouse, what will God do? He'll open up the windows of heaven. He'll pour out a blessing till there is no more need. God will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Even though he gave you the authority to rebuke the devourer yourself, in Malachi 3, God says, I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to rebuke the devourer if you're a tither. And he says, God will not allow our vine to cast her fruit before her time. And I told you on, on Tuesday, I believe tithers are redeemed from miscarriage because her vine won't cast her fruit before her time. The Bible says in Malachi 3, God will make us a land of delight and everyone will see, all nations will see that we are blessed. Why? Because we've made that kingdom connection through the tithe. Those are some pretty awesome promises, right? But did you know that those promises are not the promises for New Testament tithers? Those are the promises for Old Testament tithers that are tithing to the priesthood of Levi. This was the book of Malachi. This was before the New Covenant. This was the last book that God wrote, the last prophecy that God spoke before he went through a period of about 350 years of silence before Jesus came along. This was one of the last things that God said to Israel. He said, you need to return to me and in returning to me, one of the things that you need to return is the tithe because you've been robbing me. This is what God said. And then he said, if you do return the tithe, here's all the great things that I'm going to do for you. But that promise that he made is not promises for New Testament believers. That's the promise that God gave to Old Testament believers who were, who were tithing to the priesthood of Levi. So here's what I want to say tonight. Because those are awesome promises, right? If the promises of Malachi chapter 3 are that good, then imagine how great the promises must be for us who are New Testament believers who are tithing to, number one, a greater priesthood, and number two, we belong to a better covenant based on better promises. So as good as the promises are of Malachi chapter 3, our promises are even better. So many times in my life, I, like I say, I've been in a ministry, uh, full-time ministry for 28 years. I've heard Christians come up to me so many times in my life, and they'll say things, they'll ask questions like this. If I do this, will it send me to hell? 
If I do that, will, it, will I go to hell? If I fail to do this, will that send me to hell? And that is such a shallow way of looking at things. I've heard people say this, if I don't tithe, will I go to hell? Folks, your right standing with God has nothing to do with whether or not you tithe. Your right standing with God is a result of your faith in Jesus and the work that he did on the cross. That's, that's where your right standing with God comes from. Jesus took the sin of mankind upon himself and he died with it. Your sin was paid for 2,000 years ago on the cross. Your sin, your sin was already paid for. All you have to do is receive what Jesus did by faith. Receive that payment by faith. The Bible says believe with your heart and confess with your mouth. Now why does it say confess with your mouth? Because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is going to speak. What you believe is going to come out of your mouth. So believe with your heart, confess with your mouth, and you'll be saved. You'll be in right standing with God. So people need to stop asking the question all the, t all the time, is this going to send me to hell? Is that going to send me to hell? It, 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 if I fail to do this, what, what, will I go to hell? That's not the way that you need to look at it. That's a shallow understanding of the kingdom. Your sin is paid for. You, you, you received Jesus as your Savior. Amen? Right? You, you, you said, Lord, I'm making you the Lord of my life. Come into my heart. Take over my life. Amen? So you're in right standing with God. So stop asking the question, will I go to hell? Start asking this question. Will I short circuit my own potential? That's a question you need to ask yourself as a believer. You're in right standing with God. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're going to go to hell. You have to worry about whether or not you are going to fulfill the kingdom potential and the calling that God has placed on your life. That's a question you need to be asking yourself. Failing to tithe does not send you to hell. Failing to tithe short circuits your potential because it short circuits a kingdom principle that God put in place for your benefit. That's what failing to tithe does. Now, I want to get to the crux of what I wanted to share with you tonight. This, this is going to be good. You're going to love this. If you're taking notes, you can write this. Deuteronomy 12, Deuteronomy 14, Deuteronomy 26, and Numbers 18. Those are the four chapters where God talks about the tithe under the law. Deuteronomy 12, Deuteronomy 14, Deuteronomy 26, and Numbers 18. God made tithing a part of the law, right? So under the law, God required the nation of Israel to give 10% of their increase to the Levites. And then he required that the Levites give 10% of their increase to the high priest. And this was a requirement under law. There, there were consequences for disobeying it. But the very first tithe was not a requirement under the law. Abraham's tithe was not done under obligation. It was done by faith. It was done by thankfulness. It was done by gratefulness. And Abraham's tithe is the tithe that sets the precedent for all the other tithes. His was first. His, the, his is the one that we're supposed to model after. So Abraham's tithe was done by faith. 400 years later, God made tithing a part of the law. So this begs the question, and I asked God this question a few years ago when I was praying one day and I was studying. I said, God, why did you take something that had been done by faith, the tithe that Abraham gave, why did you take something that had been done by faith and make it a part of the law? Because isn't that a step backwards? Doing it by faith and then doing it under obligation, I don't think it's as powerful when you do something under obligation as when you do it out of the abundance and the gratefulness of your heart. Amen? How many parents do we have? <laughs> 
How many would like your, your kids to obey you out of the gratefulness and the thankfulness of their heart, not begrudgingly out of obligation? All right. So I asked God, I said, why did you take something that had been done by faith and make it a part of the law? And immediately the Holy Spirit dropped this in my spirit, dropped this whole revelation in my spirit in about three seconds. God said, I made tithing a part of the law for the same reason that I made Israel give me the spoils of Jericho. Now, as soon as God said this, I knew exactly what he was trying to tell me. I mean, just, it was dropped in my spirit in three seconds, but I, it's going to take me a little more than three seconds to explain it to y'all. So let's look at the story of Jericho, and you're going to see a powerful kingdom principle. Jericho, or sorry, Joshua chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. The Israelites had surrounded the city of Jericho. Jericho is the first city in the promised land that Israel has to conquer in order to retake their land. God gave that land to Abraham 400 years prior to this. Now they've made it into the promised land. Jericho is their first challenge, the first city that they have to conquer. They surrounded the city, and Jericho was shut up inside and out. None went out, and none came in. Verse 2. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, everyone say see. see. That's an important word right there. See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. See, Joshua, I have given Jericho to you. Had they taken Jericho yet? But God always speaks of his promises in the past tense. Because as far as God is concerned, it's already been done. I already took care of it. I have given Jericho to you. But, hey, Joshua, I've already done this, but it's not going to come to pass unless you see it. Amen. See, I have given you. You've got you to gotta see it with spirit eyes. Amen? Amen? Now, Jericho has a king. Israel doesn't. Jericho has mighty men of valor. Israel doesn't. Israel has a bunch of men who lived as slaves for 400 years. They have a bunch of men that wandered in the desert for 40 years. Joshua, your men have almost no military experience. They have no fighting experience. Joshua, you cannot do this without me. This is what God is telling Joshua. But even so, as far as I'm concerned, I've already given you this city. You got to see it the way I see it, Joshua. So here's what God did. Verse 3. You shall march around the city, all of the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Covenant. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all of the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So what is God doing here? He's giving Israel specific instructions on what to do in order to bring the walls down. They can't do this without God's help. Verse 16. Joshua said to the people, Shout! For the Lord has given you the city. Have they taken the city yet? Not yet. But faith always sees it as already being done. Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. Remember, they sent spies into the city to spy it out, and Rahab, who was a prostitute, she allowed them to hide in her house. So God said, I'm going to save her and her house. Everybody else gets wiped out. Verse 18. 
But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. Don't touch the devoted things. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go in the treasury of the Lord. So God is telling the Israelites he is requiring all of the spoil of this battle. The battle of Jericho. All of the spoil goes into the Lord's treasury. In other words, it's, it's going to the Levites. It's an offering that the Levites are going to live off of. It's, it's going to be given to the Levites. Because remember, the Levites received offerings on behalf of the Lord, right? Verse 24. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Now this is the first battle that Israel ever fought in reclaiming the promised land. The first city, the first challenge that they had. Israel had no army. Israel had no training. Israel had almost zero experience in battle. They had been slaves for 430 years. So how does a fledgling infant nation learn how to become an independent power when all they've ever known is the bondage of slavery. That's a tough thing. You are a slave. Your dad was a slave. Your grandpa was a slave. Your great grandpa was a slave. All you've known is slavery for the, for the past 400 years. You've never known ownership. You've never known freedom. You don't know commerce. You don't know business. You don't know government. You have no structure. All you know is the life of a slave. Yet God wants you to become an independent nation on your own. So God says, I'm going to help you in this process. And he tells them exactly what they need to do in order to destroy Jericho. Because remember, Israel is carrying the seed that's going to become Jesus. God is not just protecting Israel. He's protecting the seed. Israel, you are an infant nation. You know nothing about commerce, business, warfare, government, ownership, law and order. You don't know any, about it, any of these things. I'm going to have to walk you through the process of becoming a strong independent nation. So here's what I'm going to do, Israel. I will show you how to defeat this first city of Jericho. And I want you to give me all of the spoil of that battle. And then after you give me the spoil from the battle of Jericho, now I have a legal connection to you to give you every other city. You give me the first city, I'll give you all the rest of the cities. You give me the first battle, I'll help you win all the rest of the battles. In a sense, Jericho is a tithe. Do you see that? God says, God says, you give me what I require of you, and then I'll give you all the rest. You give me the 10%, I'll bless the 90%. You give me Jericho, I'll give you all the other cities. Israel, you cannot afford to not have my hand of protection and provision and guidance on the battlefield with you. You don't have any experience in battle. You can't afford to not have me working on your behalf. So give me the first battle. And when you do that, now we'll have a covenant legal kingdom connection. And then I'll be obligated to my own word. And I will give you every other battle because you connected with me by faith. Now, of course, we know the story, right? Israel didn't fully obey God in this, did they? There was one man, his name was Achan, he kept some of the spoil of Jericho for himself. And then Israel went to the next city, the city of Ai. And by the way, the city of Ai was smaller than the city of Jericho. This should have been a walk in the park for them. They should have mopped the floor with those guys. But they didn't. Israel lost the battle. They got their tails hang, handed to them. Why? Because God had no obligation 
to bless them in that battle because they didn't obey him with what he said with the battle of Jericho. They took some of the spoil. Now, let's go back to the tithe. I asked God, why did you make tithing a part of the law? God said, I made tithing a part of the law for the same reason that I made Israel give me the spoils of Jericho. The same principle applies here as the battle of Jericho did. Israel, you don't know anything about economy. You know nothing about business. You know nothing about provision. You know nothing about ownership. You lived under the Egyptian whip for four centuries. You lived in the wilderness for 40 years and I fed you manna. But now you're going to have to learn how to be independent. You're going to have to learn how to stand on your own in your own land, in the promised land. And I can't afford to have you operate without my hand of protection and provision on your finances and on your material possessions. Israel, there's too much at stake here. You're carrying the seed. You're a brand new nation who's carrying the seed that will one day become Jesus. Israel, you are carrying the seed that will destroy the works of the devil. There's too much at stake here. You can't afford to not be in covenant with me concerning your provision, concerning your finances, concerning your possessions. So here's what I'm going to do, Israel. I'm going to make tithing a part of the law so that you're forced by law to come into a legal covenant agreement with me through the tithe. I'm forcing you to do this, Israel, because if I leave you to do it on your own, you won't do it. And I can't afford to put the seed at risk. I left Jericho up to you, Israel, and you didn't even obey me with that one. So bring all the tithe into the storehouse and then watch me fulfill my promise. Right? Amen. Test me in this, he says, in Malachi chapter 3. That's the only place in the Bible where God asks us to test him. He actually asks us to put him to the test, to prove him. That's how important this is to God. God did not require the tithe as a random rule. He required the tithe because he's protecting the seed that will one day become Jesus. Israel couldn't afford to not have God's provision and his protection on their finances. By the way, neither can you. You can't afford to not have God's protection on you and on your finances. God loved Israel so much that he forced Israel by law to come into financial covenant with him through the tithe. And that's why the tithe became law. That's how powerful the tithe is. That's how important God made it. So, the answer to the question, is the tithe an Old Testament practice, or is it a New Testament practice, or, it is, or is it both? And my answer is this, I say it's neither. Because the first tithe, the tithe that set the precedent for all of them, the one that started all of this, the, the, the tithe that became the example for all the other tithes to follow, the first tither did not tithe under Old Covenant law. And he certainly didn't tithe under the New Covenant because the New Covenant hadn't been established yet. The tithe is simply the way that we connect to the kingdom with our finances. The tithe says this, God, I trust you enough and I trust you so much that I will put 10% of my finances in your kingdom. And I trust that when I put 10% of my money in your kingdom, you'll put 100% of your kingdom on my money. Amen. Amen. Dennis came up to me uh, after service on Tuesday night. And we were talking about the tithe. He says, I get it. He says, the tithe is a contract. I said, yes, precisely. That's exactly what it is. The tithe is a legal binding agreement between you and the kingdom of God. So people ask, Pastor Heath, do I have to tithe? No, you don't have to tithe. You get to tithe. You have the awesome privilege of connecting to the greatest kingdom in the universe. 
through your finances. Protecting your finances by covenant. Making a step of faith that not only ensures God's blessing on you, but also provides for the needs of the church. The tithe provided for the needs of the Levites, but that wasn't the only reason. That wasn't even the primary reason. The primary reason was so that God had a kingdom connection to Israel through their finances. And it was such an awesome thing that God required the Israelites to do it by law. The tithe is 10% of your gross income, and it's a legal binding spiritual agreement between you and the kingdom of God. Dennis was right. It's, it's a contract. I've told you this before. I'll say it again. I've been a tither since I was 11 years old. Now, when I was young, I used to tithe because I thought I was required to do so. I didn't know what I know now. I, I thought, okay, I got to obey what Malachi chapter 3 says. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse. I, I was doing it under obligation. I was doing it under law. But later on in my life, I realized, okay, I'm not required to tithe under law because Jesus fulfilled the law. But just because the law has been fulfilled doesn't mean that there's not elements of the law that we still abide by. The law tells us thou shalt not steal. The law, the law tells us thou shalt not commit adultery. The law tells us thou shalt not commit murder. Did Jesus do away with those things when he fulfilled the law? No, no. But we don't tithe under requirement. And see, I know that now. I used to think I, I was required to tithe. I now know that I'm not required to tithe. I am privileged to tithe. I know more than I, than I used to know. I've never stopped tithing. I'm never going to stop tithing. Why? Because it's my contract. I got promises I can stand on. And the promises are even greater than the promises of Malachi chapter 3 because my promises are based on a better covenant that's based on better promises and has a better priesthood. Amen? Amen. So no, you don't have to tithe. You get to tithe. And man, that's, a, that's an awesome privilege. I am a blessed man. And I know that I'm blessed because I continue to connect myself and my family to the kingdom of God through through the tithe, through giving. Amen? Amen. So that, that, that's, that's basically the tithe in a nutshell. It's a contract. It's, it's, it's your opportunity to connect to the kingdom of God by faith. Now, why does the Bible say 10%? I don't know. Why doesn't it say 90? Why does it not say 40? But that's just the number that Abraham set as a precedent. It's the number that God put into uh, operation in the law. But, you know, a lot of people will say, well, well Jesus did away with the, with the tithe. Actually, there's nothing in the New Testament that ever indicates that Jesus did away with the tithe. There's one scripture where Jesus talks about people that tithe for attention. And he basically tells people, you should tithe don't do away with the tithe. Don't do away with any of the good things that you do. Just do it for the right reason. Amen? We don't pray in order to get attention. We don't tithe in order to get attention. We don't do anything in order to be seen. We do everything because we want to be pleasing to God. And I also do things because I want to connect to the benefits of the kingdom. Amen? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of his benefits those who come to believe to God, those who come to God must believe that he is and that he, he is a rewarder that's the God I serve that's the God I'm connecting to can you say amen to that tonight amen. so this Tuesday uh, what I'm going to do we're, we're not going to continue to talk about the teaching part of the tithe but this Tuesday I'm going to be giving you some tithing testimonies and I'm just going to share with you some awesome stories and some awesome testimonies of things that I've done, things that some of my friends have experienced, and other awesome testimonies of people that have connected to the kingdom of God through the tithe. It's awesome. We serve an awesome God. Amen. And we've got an awesome covenant based on awesome promises. Amen? Amen. Give God praise tonight. Hi, I'm Heath. And I'm Louise. And we want to thank you so much for watching this video. 
Faith Life Worship Center in Naples, Florida is a Bible-believing, spirit-filled, non-denominational church. If you live in Southwest Florida and you're looking for a good church with a fun and energetic contemporary worship experience, awesome children and youth ministries, and a great family atmosphere, we'd love to see you at one of our services really soon. Go to faithlifeworshipcenter.com to learn more about our church, watch other messages online, check out our store, or support our ministry financially. Please take a few seconds to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can also find us on social media. We hope that you'll watch other messages online, but what we really want is to see you in person at Faith Life Worship Center. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye.